in the book of Psalms. We've been going through the book of Psalms now. We started our new series last week as we started with Psalm 1, and we are now uh, this week diving into Psalm number 8. We'll be looking at Psalm 8 today, and as I was preparing uh, to bring this message today, I was thinking about Hall of Fame speeches and Hall of Fame debates in sports. You may wonder, what does that have to do with Psalm 8? Well, we'll get there in a moment. But first off, I, I wanted to ask you, have you ever heard of anybody going into the Baseball Hall of Fame? Who are some Baseball Hall of Famers that you know of or have heard of? Dan Musial, Baseball Hall of Famer. Good. Who else? Who are some other Baseball Hall of Famers? Some of them just go in. Yeah, every year there's a new crop of Hall of Famers that go in, right? And every year there's a list, a curated list of names of people who gets to go into the Hall of Fame. Did any of you get a letter this year that your name was up for the Baseball Hall of Fame? So I just wanted to make sure, just wanted to throw it out there, didn't want to leave anybody out. Well, every year there's a, an accumulated list of these people and their accomplishments and there's a debate that goes on inside sports about who exactly is deserving of entrance into the Hall of Fame. It happens in many of our traditional American sports. It happens in football. It happens in baseball. It happens in basketball and hockey. There are these essentially long-standing museums where you can go and observe the history of the game. You can go and see the influential creators the people who have inspired generations of athletes to participate and to play in a particular game. Well, what does this have to do with Psalm 8? Well, we hear in Psalm 8 in verse 1, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. All I can think about is Hall of Fame debates. People wondering who's, who's worth going in, whose name will be remembered, whose name will be praised, whose, whose face will be turned into a bronze or golden statue or a bust or maybe a wax statue. Who will be remembered? Who's worthy of being remembered? Who's worthy of being praised as being a creator, a contributor, Someone that has inspired others. This Hall of Fame debate doesn't fall on deaf ears and it doesn't go on without consequences. People who go into the Hall of Fame are remembered for generations. We all know the names of Willie Mays, Babe Ruth, Shoeless Joe Jackson. We know these names. They've been remembered. They've been honored. They've been deemed worthy of remembering. Children collect baseball cards and play video games and pretend in the backyard. When I was growing up, we used to play basketball and we would always pretend that we were different basketball players. While we were dribbling, while we were playing, we would say, I'm going to make this move like so-and-so. I'm going to go to the basket like Michael Jordan. I'm going to play in the post like Shaq or Hakeem. I'm going to shoot a sky hook. Children even remember the names of these Hall of Famers, and it's through the remembrance of these names that glory and honor and memories are passed down. The praise is given. Psalm 8, verse 2 says, Through the praise of children and infants, you, O Lord, have established a stronghold against your enemies. To silence the foe and the avenger. The psalmist here is talking about someone who is worthy of praise. Someone who is worthy of remembering. Someone who has inspired generations. Someone who's creative. Someone who's worth talking about. Someone who is worth pretending to be like. Someone who children are excited to meet speak about and learn from. Psalm 8 is a beautiful invitation 
into worship of who the Lord is. Psalm 8 invites us to observe the work that the Lord has done throughout creation. It invites us to look, to stare with awe and with magnifying glasses and with time to observe what God has done in this world and to appreciate it, to enjoy it, to delight in it. I have a good friend back in Michigan who really enjoys collecting baseball cards. He's got some old baseball cards. So for one particular holiday, a friend of his got him a baseball card. And it was just a cheap baseball card that he found online. He found it through one of those online auction houses and he, he purchased it for about $1.50. I mean, it cost more to ship the thing than it did to purchase the card. And he got it framed in a little $5 frame and he gave it to his buddy. And his buddy said, this is such a thoughtful gift. And what was amazing about it was this card was framed. It was framed so that way the front picture was showing. So you could see the front of the baseball card. You couldn't see the stats on the back. But the gentleman who received it, who loved baseball cards, he knew the stats on the back already. He could tell you about his rookie year and how exciting it was and how many home runs he hit and what his on-base percentage was. He remembered it from when he was a kid and how this player was someone who he had admired. He remembered the deeds of this player. They inspired him. They stuck with him. For years later, such that even just a little tiny gift, just a small reminder about who this player was, was a big gift coming from a friend. Well, for us today, the psalmist invites us into worship the Lord in a very similar way. The Lord invites us into worship by examining God's creation and engaging in remembering, observing, and getting creative with the things that are around us, with God's creation. The psalmist says in verse 3, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. The psalmist is reflecting on the great deeds, the stats on the back of the Lord's card. Remembering creation. He's remembering the Lord's great works. And it's at this point that the psalmist almost gets a little emotional. Have you ever seen anyone at one of these Hall of Fame speeches as they're accepting a a reward, oftentimes players get very emotional as they realize this is a lifetime of work that is now being recognized and summed up in this achievement. The psalmist does much the same thing. He reflects on God's work, on God's creation, on God's worthiness of being praised. And in verse 4, he gets emotional. He says in verse 4, What is mankind? that you are mindful of them. Human beings, that you care for them. It's almost a statement of comparison. Like what, like, what are we? We look around the universe and we see mountains that don't crumble. We see the Grand Canyon that's older than all of us in this room combined. And we see the great glories that God gives us. The sun rising each day. A massive ball of fire that is thousands of miles away from our planet. That God made. The psalmist gets a little emotional and just goes, where do we fit into all of this? Into all of this glory. Where do we fit in? And then the psalmist continues and he shows us, and the Lord invites us in Psalm 8, not just to worship Him, but the Lord also invites us into relationship with Him. That God provides us a place in His created order. Let's read together verse 5. You have made them, talking about us as humanity, you have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. So we go from this moment, this introduction of Psalm 8, where the psalmist is is telling us about the worth and the glory and the grandeur of God's creation, and He's inviting us in to worship this glorious and great God. 
He gets emotional as he compares humanity to the rest of creation. You almost think he's going to despair for a moment. But he doesn't. He actually rejoices in his place. He rejoices saying, you've made us a little bit lower than the angels. We, you and I, are actually crowned with glory and honor. Us. When you woke up today, did you remember to put on your crown of glory and honor this morning? We have been crowned with glory and honor by our Maker. Now that's an inspiring thought for a moment. As I was preparing for this sermon, I was thinking back over different things that inspire me. We've had some of these pictures up on the Jumbotron here today. I'm not sure if they're coming through or not. Can you see them okay? Not real? Not real well. Let's try hitting the middle light. Let's see if we can't see them a little bit better. Some of these are some of the photos that we took while we went on vacation. We were gone for a while and we went to Michigan and various parts of the Midwest. I took some pictures of things that inspire me. <laughs> there's food, there's beaches, there's clouds, there's rainbows, there's storms, there's people. The Mackinac Bridge at night. And you know, it's amazing of all these different things that inspire us, of all these different things that are worthy of looking at, it's amazing how God has made us in the midst of all of this grand beauty. We can travel all over the country, you can travel all over the world, and you can see glorious and grand and beautiful things. And yet we're told right here in verse 8 that the crowning, achieving a pillar of God's creation is us. You and me. That we've been crowned with glory and honor. Now there are lots of things in this world that inspire us. Maybe speeches, maybe people, maybe relationships, maybe wonderful destinations, maybe moments our children, our work. But God has given something to us that ought to inspire us as well. And that's purpose. God has actually given us a purpose made in His created order. What is that purpose? Well, the psalmist tells us in verse 6. Verse 6 says, You made them, that's us, humans, you made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all the flocks and herds and the animals of the world, the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. God invites us in. He creates this glorious universe. He crowns us with glory and honor and then He puts us in charge of it. We have place and purpose in God's creation. Then as we look around creation and we see the things that inspire us, we can look around and see the things that bring so much delight to us. And we read Psalm 8 and we can be reminded today and encouraged that one of the things that brings delight and inspires God is us. That God delights in us as part of His creation. That God delights in us and gives us a place and a purpose. That God gives us a task, a job, a responsibility. That we have position in this world that God has created. One of these positions that God has given us is of worship. In fact, I would argue. But that is the position that we've been given, to live life in worship. Now, whenever a preacher says that, whenever I hear a preacher say that, I think, oh goodness, I hope all of life doesn't have to be a worship service. <laughs> That's not what we mean when we say that all of life is worship. When God has called us into worship to enjoy God's creation, to rule over God's creation, as God has invited us to take part in His glorious work, in His glorious created world, God invites us into worship in all that we do. 
not just in our hour of worship on Sunday mornings, but also Monday through Saturday. That we have been given a unique position amongst everything else. In all of the created universe, we, as God's created people, are different than the mountains. We're different than the sun. We're different than the rivers and the oceans. We're different than horses and cheetahs and elephants. Bet you didn't think you were going to wake up and hear that today. We're different. Not just different in our abilities, but also different in our position. We have a unique position in God's created order that we can render worship to our Creator. That everything that we can do can point back to the One who has allowed us to do it. That in all that we do, we can, as verse 2 says, through the praise of children and infants, establish a stronghold. That we're the ones that can tell the stories of God's great work of God's inspiring work, of God's creative work. Well, every year, people argue who gets into the Hall of Fame. Every year. Every year there's arguments with sports journalists. People say, this guy should have gotten in, that guy shouldn't have gotten in. Oh, that guy got in too early. Oh, this guy's a first ballot Hall of Famer, no problem. Oh, that guy might take him a few years. All these arguments about the worth and the value God knows your worth and knows your value because He's made you. He's made you different than all the rest of His creation. He's made you with an ability to worship Him, to remember Him, to sing of His praises, to pray to Him and to ask Him to intervene. And sure enough, God does intervene. The Lord's work in creation invites us into a purpose and a place of worship that isn't confined to one place of worship. The Lord invites us into a relationship that goes wherever we go because He is with us. The Lord also invites us into a relationship with one another. We don't read in Psalm 8 that some of God's people have been made with glory and honor and others have been made less so. We read that God has made us, humanity, with glory and honor. And so as we treat one another and as we have opportunities to interact with one another and build relationships with one another, we treat one another as Jesus taught us to treat one another. To treat one another as we would want to be treated. With honor, with respect, with kindness, with patience. Remembering even when we wrong one another, that we are still both made in God's image. That we are still both, as Psalm 8 writes, crowned with glory and honor. Psalm 8 is a lot about worship. It's a lot about God's worship. It's a lot about us and our involvement and God's invitation to us into worship. Not just on Sunday mornings, but every day of our lives. Because God has redeemed us from so much more than just a little bit of our life. God has redeemed us and made us whole, new, in the entirety of our lives. Jesus in Mark 12 is challenged and he's attempted and brought into a trap by teachers in his day. In Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through 17, we hear about how there were those who were trying to trap Jesus into a trick question about paying taxes to Caesar. And they brought Jesus a coin and they said to him, Who's, who ought we to pay? Should we pay Caesar his taxes? Or should we not? And Jesus said, Bring me the coin and let me look at it. And he said, Whose image is on this coin? And they reply to him, well, it's Caesar's image. So Jesus says to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. Psalm 8 is a beautiful, glorious, inspirational reminder to us that we have been made in God's image. We. 
humanity. That God has made all things and that God has invited us in to worship, into relationship with Him, and into a life that's filled with purpose as we live out that life of worship. And that even as we render worship unto God, we are actually doing what Jesus has commanded us to do, to render unto God what is God. So I want to encourage you this week. Who is it that ought to get into the hall? Who is it that ought to be remembered? Whose deeds ought to be remembered for generations? Who, who ought to inspire little children to remember their stats on the back of baseball cards? Well, for us as Christians, for us as believers in the one true God, all the glory, all the highlights, all the praise are to be remembered by us and celebrated by us throughout our lives. And that I would say that that is what worship is. That we remember, that we celebrate, that we give value and worth to God Almighty. For glory be to God for the great things that He has done. Psalm 8 ends with this eruption of praise. There's no other way for the psalm to end. He goes through, the psalmist goes through this list of things that you and I have been made rulers over. All the flocks and the herds in verse 7. All the birds in the sky in verse 8. And then he ends by saying, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is Your name in all the earth. This is the God who we serve. This is the God who has made us. This is the God who invites us into worship. And this is the God who we remember, who we celebrate, and who each day we ascribe worth to in our lives. Let's close in prayer.